Okay, um, uh, my name is Amir Mian. Uh, I'm a pediatric oncologist here at Arkansas Children's Hospital. And in the next um, 30, 35 minutes, uh, I'll give a very, uh, present a very brief introduction to uh, uh, pediatric leukemias, lymphomas, and also touch upon brain tumors. And towards the end, I'll, I'll talk about uh, fever neutropenia, which is also a pediatric concern, a pediatric oncology concern, which is extremely important in these patients. So let's start with the, uh, with the highlights. So in pediatric oncology, generally speaking, uh, cancer in pediatrics is relatively rare. Of the, all the cancers, about three to 4% of uh, cancers are in pediatrics. Um, uh, the, the biology is very different than adults. Uh, there are um, Pre there's a predisposition for genetic factors, and there's a strong association with, uh, with uh, various genetic syndromes. At least in the United States and also in uh, some of the other um, European countries, um, most of the pediatric leukemia and most of the pediatric cancers are treated on very standardized protocols. Uh, and uh, the same is true to quite an extent in Pakistan as well. So what I want to do today is to touch upon leukemias, lymphomas, and CNS tumors, as these are the most common three categories of pediatric cancers. What's also interesting is um, overall survival in these, uh, amongst these uh, um, cancers is relatively, um, uh, relatively good. About 70, 75% of these patients survive, which is uh, uh, fairly remarkable. And obviously the survival is uh, improving as we improve upon the, uh, the, the, the treatment. What it also means is that there's, our, there's increased number of pediatric cancer survivors um, who, who live a fairly normal life, uh, yet they have uh, unique long-term issues as a result of the chemotherapy. So this, uh, di uh, this bar chart highlights uh, just the distribution of pediatric cancers. Uh, as you can see from the top, Leukemias, lymphomas, and brain tumors are the most common ones. They, cause, they make about 70 to 75% of the, of the pediatric, uh, um, 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 pediatric cancers, and the rest of the tumors are relatively rare. What's also unique about pediatric cancers is uh, different cancers, um, different um, uh, cancers are, have a high um, prevalence rate at the different uh, specific age groups. So for example, in this slide, what you can see is uh, the three types of cancers, neuroblastoma, retinoblastoma, and Wilms tumor. Uh, neuroblastoma is uh, in red, uh, retino is in green, and Wilms is in blue. So they, they have a pretty high uh, predisposition and a high, relatively high frequency during the first six to 10 years of life. And beyond that, their diagnosis is fairly rare. And uh, likewise, uh, let's look at hepatic, uh, bone, soft tissue, and germ cell tumors. So let's look at the, uh, uh, the hepatic tumors, so which is the black line. Primarily, you would see them earlier uh, during the first maybe four to five years of life. And beyond that, that's relatively rare. Germ tumors usually are in the, the blue line, shows uh, higher predisposition and higher prevalence during the first four, three to four years. And then there's a relatively higher prevalence during the adolescence. And the same true is true with, uh, with bone tumors. During the early years, we don't see a whole lot of bone tumors, but um, after adolescence, there's a relatively higher prevalence and higher risk. Now, this uh, slide uh, sort of highlights uh, the three common tumors that we were talking about earlier, leukemias, lymphomas, and the brain tumors. So let's look at the bl black line, the, the pediatric acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So you've got a very high predisposition during the first eight to 10 years of life, and then the, uh, uh, then the prevalence sort of evens out. What's really interesting is there's usually a peak during the first uh, maybe seven to eight years. So statistically speaking, that a child has the highest risk of acute lymphoblastic leukemia during the first eight to 10 years of life. And then the, the risk sort of evens out. Lymphomas don't see a whole lot during the first eight to 10 years. And then the adolescence, uh, the, the, the prevalence rises. And to an extent, the same holds true for, uh, for brain tumors as well. So let's talk about leukemias. Um, the, the three main types that I want to talk today is uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, for sure, ALL. The, um, the incidence is uh, 
probably five to three, um, close to 3,000 new cases in the U.S. per year. And the, the, the incidence is fairly similar, I think, in, in Pakistan as well, although I don't know exactly what the numbers are. It is subdivided into different categories, different subtypes based on again, phenotypes. And the long-term survival for acute lymphoblastic leukemia is excellent. About 80-85% of these patients are cured and live a fairly normal life. Acute myelogenous leukemia, on the other end, is relatively rare. Um, it's also a smaller, a smaller proportion of all the leukemias, and it is somewhat aggressive disease, and the long-term survival is not as good, so disease-free survival is approximately 50 to 55 percent. CML, on the other hand, is fairly rare in pediatrics. Uh, we don't see a whole lot of these patients. Um, a lot of them ultimately present with or to, to transform into blast crisis. The survival is significantly better, about 80-85%. And the uh, one of the main reasons for improved survival is um, uh, the the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and also with the uh, with the uh, protocols um, um, for putting these patients in for for a potential transplant if the matched sibling is uh, available. So let's talk about leukemias per se. You know, one of the things that's really uh, important for uh, for all of us to to recognize is uh, leukemia by definition is a is a um, malignant disorder of the stem cells, and stem cells reside in the bone marrow or hematopoietic system. So when the stem cells of the hematopoietic system fails all the three cell lines eventually get dysregulated. So what you'll see is, uh, depending upon the clone, either the white cells may be very high or low. A lot of times it may be somewhat normal, but the, the differential is fairly abnormal. A lot of these patients do present with neutropenia to quite an extent and also have infectious complications when they come in. Because the, uh, the red cells are um, a compromise, so they, they, uh, that leads to a uh, drop in hemoglobin, and that is also associated with reticular cytopenia. Uh, a lot of these patients quite often present with uh, pallor and uh, fatigue. With the drop in platelets, um, as you can imagine, a lot of these patients will present with petechiae, bleeding disorders, and bruising, and um, uh, simultaneously may or may not present with DIC at the same time. So when the primary hematopoietic system fails, the, this, there is a sign of expansion of the extramedullary hematopoietic system. And as a result, you would see some degree of uh, reactive lymphadenopathy and also thymic enlargement in these patients. What's also interesting is that these patients have hepatosplenomegaly. A lot of it is secondary hematopoiesis, but uh, substantial uh, to, to an extent, they also is a result of uh, uh, trapping of the leukemia cells. In addition, these patients also have bone pains, limping um, as a result, which is pretty common, and a fever, which could be related to um, the infection as well. So just to sort of all in all, these patients will have primarily symptoms of bone marrow failure, um, as I said earlier, uh, quite often they'll have symptoms of uh, uh, extramedullary proliferation and some non-specific symptoms, which are primarily constitutional symptoms, which are fairly vague and non-specific. So as you can see over here, the differential is fairly, uh, this is just a small uh, sort of a snapshot. So the differential is pretty uh, long list. It could be malignant, it could be non-malignant, it could be uh, uh, hematological diseases, it could be solid tumors. So it's, it's a fairly uh, large differential. What's really important is to put these signs together and start with the initial workup and then uh, uh, move on. So the initial workup should include a very detailed physical in history, a CBC, a review of the blood smear, and basic electrolytes and uh, liver function tests. And also, almost always, these patients need an x-ray chest to look for thymic enlargement. So the basic labs are the ones that I just said earlier. And then additional labs, once you've got concerns for an underlying uh, hematological malignancy, the additional labs should include uh, um, tumor lysis labs. So these include primarily electrolytes, uric acid, and, uh, uh, and, um, and LDH. If the patient comes in fe with, feb with fever or is febrile and you don't have any obvious uh, reason, the uh, patient should definitely get fe uh, blood culture and start with fever uh, with, with antibiotics. And also, because a lot of these patients may have um, um, uh, cardiac toxic medication, so you need baseline uh, function assessment of the heart and renal uh, function as well. 
further management uh, in bone marrow aspirate and uh, IV fluids and then start antibiotics and start the treatment. <clears throat> so this is how a bone So the same patient is lying uh, in a lateral, and um, uh, we um, uh, we palpate the posterior iliac crest, and under uh, under sterile condition, you inject uh, you actually introduce a needle into the into the into the crest and collect a bone marrow using uh, using a, 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 a spinal um, using a using a, a syringe, and that. Could then aspirate is sent for a, um, for a, for flow cytometry and additional testing. You can also do a bone marrow biopsy, um, for pretty much the same way. The needle is slightly different, and that could be sent for cellularity and uh, other evaluations as well. So this is what a normal uh, blood smear biopsy and aspirate looks like. And I want to sort of highlight what normal is so that you'd appreciate what abnormal is. So on the on the top, what you can see is the uh, red cells. Um, but this is uh, obviously a white cell and these dots are platelets. So this is a normal distribution. And a bone marrow biopsy has a normal architecture with the hematopoietic system. What you can also appreciate is uh, um, uh, all uh, extra fat, which is, uh, which is normal content of the, the bone. Uh, typically, a cellularity should be about 90 95%, anywhere from 5 to 10% is fat. And this is what the aspirate looks like. Here you've got trilineage hematopoiesis. So you've got three cell lines. The largest cells are the platelets, are the megakaryocytes. And there's relatively smaller cells with the darker nucleus is the red cells. And then the other cells are um, various uh, in various shapes and um, um, uh, sizes. These are the the white cells. So this would be a uh, this would be a band, for example. So you've got white cells, red cells, and platelets. Trilineal hematopoiesis, adequate cellularity, no obvious clones, and no abnormal cells. That would be a normal um, a normal. Uh, uh, bone marrow sample. Now let's look at the abnormal. So what you see over here is uh, obviously the red cells and these immature large uh, mononuclear cells are very typical for blasts. So this would be an um, Look, this would be very likely a leukemia or a malignant process. Uh, when you do the biopsy for these patients, uh, what you see is uh, the uh, the, uh, the the bio, the bone uh, sample itself is packed with uh, leukemia cells. And over here, as you can imagine, and you can just sort of compare the two. There's not a whole lot of uh, um, there's not a whole lot of fat, and this cellularity is all packed up. And when you, you smear, look at the smear, now there's hardly any, uh, there's hardly any trilineage hematopoiesis. And most of these cells are um, stained uh, pretty um, uniformly and they look abnormal and immature. And there's not a whole lot of variety and uh, there is no uh, trilineage. You don't appreciate a whole lot of uh, uh, trilineage hematopoiesis. So this would be a very typical and very classic for, uh, for leukemia. So when we diagnose leukemia, you know, one of the things that we really need to look at um, is uh, identify uh, some prognostic factors. So um, these are some of the common prognostic factors that are um, um, that are listed. And there's no sort of you know uh, there's no. Um, specific order per se. So the white count is important for us um, when the patient comes in with a white count of more than 50,000. This is just by consensus. Um, the the uh, a white count of more than 50,000 is considered higher risk, lower than 50,000 is obviously uh, standard risk. And the rapidity of response is, e uh, is equally important in terms of prognosis. If a patient who has, uh, who has achieved remission at the end of the first cycle of chemotherapy, which is end of induction, if the patient is in remission, that's a good prognostic sign. However, if the patient is not in remission and has persistent disease, that's considered an adverse prognostic factor. Age is important. Less than one is high risk. More than 10 is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, is also high risk. Between one and ten are considered standard risk. Females generally um, have a favorable prognosis. Absence of CNS disease in the spinal fluid is is a good prognostic uh, uh, sign. And then most importantly, you know, we always look at genetics and we look at various translocations and deletions and the number of chromosomes because it's been shown over and over again that there is a vast vast array of uh, chromosomes and trans locations, which are sort of highlighted in this pie um, diagram, which seem to correlate very strongly 
without film. So what we've seen, so what we've seen over the last uh, 15 to 20 years or so is that specific genes, specific translocations directly correlate with outcome. So let's just look on the uh, survival curve on the left, which is, uh, uh, which is highlighted here. So what you see is, uh, these are all leukemia patients, fairly large uh, cohort, about a thousand patients or so, who are, uh, who are standard risk patients who are treated on standardized protocols over about 15 to 16 years of age. What you see is patients who've got tri who with trisomies 4, 10, and 17, their survival, their long-term survival is, is, is far better than patients who have, for example, uh, uh, for, for example, um, 411 translocations. So on the top, so trisomy 4, 10, 17 have a good prognosis and compare that to 411, which has a far poor prognosis in terms of long-term survival, which is um, about 50% for 411. The 922 translocation appears to be far worse. And this, is, this data is uh, before the, uh, the TKIs were, uh, uh, were used. So obviously, the new data shows that the, and the TKI has really changed the uh, overall um, survival curve. So that would, that would be a very, very, uh, that is now far better than what it is shown in this, uh, in this diagram. So what I, the, 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 the key point over here is presence and absence of specific translocations really affect outcome. And what you see here is, is pretty compelling. So let's look at the long-term outcomes. Uh, Five-year survival is pretty good, about 80-85%. Some studies would say uh, suggest as, as good as about 90% or so, which is pretty remarkable. They do, there is a, a risk for second malignancies, especially for those patients who may have gotten uh, craniospinal radiation. You know, there's always this question whether um, the survivors' offsprings uh, are at a high risk. And as of now, the data show that there is no increased risk of cancer in amongst uh, uh, the offsprings of, uh, of, of, of these patients. There are some long-term side effects and cardiomyopathy and uh, uh, impaired intellectual functioning is, is, uh, is relatively common, more so for patients who may have gotten a higher dose of anthracyclines and also who may have gotten uh, cranial radiation as well. There are some bone um, um, changes with avascular necrosis, especially with steroids, primarily dexamethasone, more so in adolescents and uh, than, than in younger kids, and also some degree of thyroid or uh, endocrine deficiency, and uh, so some degree of obesity is common. So let's move on to the lymphomas. Hodgkin's disease is uh, um, classically, um, um, this is a classic um, this sort of uh, malignancy of lymphoid um, uh, tissues and lymphoid organ. Um, uh, the, the most I said that sort of a textbook presentation is what we call B symptoms. So what B symptoms mean is uh, they're sort of characterized into three uh, different categories. So weight loss of uh, more than 10% uh, for no obvious reason over a two to three months period, an unexplained fever more than 38 degrees on a daily basis for at least two weeks, 10 to 10 days to two weeks, and uh, night sweats uh, for no other obvious infectious reasons. So these are B symptoms. Lymphadenopathy is fairly common in Hodgkin's disease. These, the, the lymph nodes, very classic appearance is they're non-tender and somewhat rubbery and they're sort of firm and uh, they're all sort of clumped together. And they may be present for months quite often. And they, you know, a lot of times, depending upon what the uh, aggregate lymph nodes or where the, uh, the lymphoid tissue is, if it's in the mediastinum, a lot of these patients may have uh, respiratory symptoms as well, cough, wheezing, and things of that sort. Very unusual symptoms are uh, uh, pruritus more so in adolescence, and that's something that we see once in a while. And also at times, uh, because of histamine release, there's uh, alcohol-induced pain um, at the site of the lymph node, and we see that once in a while in, in adolescence as well. There are some associated risk factors with EBV, and there are obviously many different subtypes with histological uh, 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 differences. So Hodgkin's is very classic in terms of how it presents. It's usually a localized disease, and it spreads anatomically. 
very classic when you do the biopsy of these lymph nodes, you see reeds turned up cells. Um, and again, that's, uh, that's a very typical uh, test question. And they're very different uh, pathological subtypes. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, on the other hand, is more of a sort of a systemic disease. It's, uh, it has many different subtypes as well, depending upon the site of, uh, depending upon the cell of origin, but it is not sort of localized. It is a systemic disease per se. Differences in terms of prevalence and age. Uh, as you can see, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is uh, relatively rare. Hodgkin's is, uh, lymphoma is fairly common uh, between the two types, and the, the, the incidence tends to, um, uh, to increase substantially during the adolescent years. So, Let's look at the presentation. So, you know, we already talked about the, uh, the B symptoms. Um, lymphadenopathy is, um, is associated with Hodgkin's as well. And one of the things that I really... Uh, when you look at the lymph node, uh, the, uh, a lot of times patients, because of infectious reasons and other uh, causes, patients may have cervical or even at times axillary lymph nodes. Um, again, obviously infectious and reactive disease has to be ruled out, but I, I want to highlight and stress that supraclavicular lymph nodes have to really be treated very differently. Uh, you really have to make sure that they are, um, they're, you know, they are looked into and if somebody has a, a host of B symptoms and has supraclavicular lymph nodes, then that patient needs to be um, investigated uh, and those nodes needs to be either biopsied or additional labs or scans need to be done because it's very likely, uh, there's a very high, high likelihood that the patient may have an underlying malignancy, primarily lymphomas. And then obviously we talked about unusual uh, symptoms as well. One of the things which is, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, Common, especially if the patients have mediastinal involvement, is uh, uh, this persistent non-responsive cough. So it's really important for these patients to have a baseline um, X-ray and to look for mediastinal widening. If the mediastinum seems to be widened, then that needs to be biopsied to make sure that there's no underlying malignancy. Risk factors are shown here. Underlying immune deficiency is, is a risk factor, especially for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Prior EBV infection definitely is, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is, there's an association, age, and then obviously some genetic predispositions are also there. So I'm going to highlight this, this patient, uh, so, uh, especially because uh, this, uh, this patient comes in with a mediastinal widening. And this is a very acute presentation. So on the, on the, on the, on the left side, what you see is an x-ray uh, with a fairly large mediastinum. So the patient comes in with uh, a wheezing that's been going on for quite some time and has not been responding to standard asthma medications, and then comes, uh, comes back to the emergency room with worsening of the uh, um, respiratory symptoms, including cough and dyspnea. And when the, when the, the CT was, uh, uh, was performed, it showed a uh, very large mediastinum with fairly compressed uh, airway. When this was biopsied, it turned out to be a lymphoma. And obviously, uh, the, the treatment was started right away. And within a short period of time, uh, what you see is, uh, especially the, 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 uh, the x-rays, in the CT scan on the um, um, on, on the lower panel, what you see is for uh, within about a week or ten days a substantial improvement in both this, the the width of the mediastinum as well as the uh, uh, the airway, which is highlighted by these arrows here. So the the, the reason I sort of bring it up is uh, these are the patients when they come in, they are. Uh, relatively sick, uh, they uh, have a compromised airway, and if there is a delay in uh, either management or if there's delay in uh, um, in diagnosing these patients, or if there's unnecessary sedation given to these patients for for any reason, this could be pretty, uh, pretty, uh, fairly devastating. There's a high mortality associated with for uh, for these patients. Another different type, uh, um, unique type of lymphoma is called Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, and I want to sort of highlight this because uh, uh, this is um, a very aggressive uh, 
uh, lymphoma. Um, and the reason for that is it's got a shortest doubling half-life, so a doubling, doubling time. So uh, within about 24 to 24 hours or so, the, the, the volume of the, uh, the, the lymphoma literally doubles up. So these are the patients when they come in, uh, they need to be worked up fairly fast, and there there are uh, some specific uh, genetic uh, uh, testing that you can do. And then um, uh, one of the things that uh, I always tell our residents here is, as well is that it should always be in a differential diagnosis for any child more than five years of age who presents with interception. So and that um, if somebody comes in with interception who's more than five years of age, that biopsy needs to be uh, sent for a, um, uh, for to pathology to look uh, specifically for uh, for any malignancy. And on top of the differential would be Burkitt's lymphoma for that patient. So let's look at the overall survival. <clears throat> so for Hodgkin's, overall survival is excellent, especially for low-risk patients. About 90, 95% of these patients are disease-free and live a normal life. High-risk patients, even though it's um, advanced stage, but still the outcome is excellent for Hodgkin's disease. And to quite an extent, the same holds true for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The only uh, sort of caveat here is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is a slightly high risk of uh, uh, relapse, uh, and uh, especially those with a T-cell disease. Um, the, the survival is fairly comparable. The third one, let's talk about the brain tumors. And I want to sort of highlight um, you know, um, a point, uh, which is uh, that there's this uh, sort of notion that uh, you know, children and adults would present exactly the same way when it comes to brain tumor. And this sort of myth is far from truth. So just the basic facts about brain tumors, um, about 3,000 3, to 3,500 new patients are seen um, and here in the U.S. Um, there are some associated risk factors uh, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for brain tumors, radiation, underlying tuberous sclerosis, for example, and uh, underlying carcinoma is, is uh, uh, other risk factors. But the, um, to, a, to quite an extent, the outcome is a fairly, um, 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 a fairly good, about 60, 60 to 70 percent of them have, far, uh, have five-year survival. There's a caveat, though. Uh, there's a high morbidity and uh, quite a few um, uh, of these patients have significant long-term deficits, which uh, as a result of either surgery, radiation, or treatment of, uh, of the uh, primary brain tumor itself. So, you know, this sort of bar, bar diagram highlights uh, the two differences between uh, an adults and pediatrics. And I want to make sure that we sort of, you know, uh, pay special attention to this. So uh, let, let's look at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the one on, ch uh, on the right, which is children. So um, what you see is about 70 to 75% of the children have infratentorial tumors. And only about maybe 25 to 30% of the children have supratentorial tumors. And exactly the opposite is true for adults. So in adults, a vast majority of the tumors are supratentorial, and only a small fraction of the tumor is infratentorial. So it's exactly the opposite in terms of distribution. And this distribution is extremely important. It's important because uh, that uh, sort of uh, uh, that shows and that correlates with the symptoms, and, um, and therefore it's 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 really critical in terms of uh, how we uh, you know, how we how these patients present and how we um, how we examine them and how we um, follow these patients. So the just to sort of very briefly go over the um, the the basic anatomy. So you've got a highlighted uh, uh, within this. Uh, Oval is the tentorium, so, so the infratentorial is obviously the the area in, within the within the oval, and supratentorial is the one above uh, above that. What you see is uh, primarily we're if for infratentorial region we're looking at uh, cerebellum, the 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 fourth ventricle, and uh, to an extent this cranial nerves as well. Supratentorial obviously is uh, above and beyond that. So classic signs for uh, uh, let me just, let me just go back over here for a minute. So the you know one of the things which uh, which we really have to um, um, uh, sort of stress upon and be very clear. So in pediatrics, the because a vast majority of the patients present with infratentorial masses, meaning it, it, it would present in cerebellum or in the in the brainstem, for example. So the the primary presence 
representation is going to consist of cellular signs. The prime representation is also going to consist of uh, uh, perhaps uh, um, cranial nerve involvement. And because of the cerebellar, um, the, the mass of the cerebellum, there may be, um, there may be um, um, a sort of blockade of the spinal fluid. And as a result, uh, the, uh, the hydrocephalus will be uh, very often finding. And these patients may have those typical signs with headaches, which is worse in the morning and gets better as the days goes. Whereas in supratentorium, they will not have any cerebellar signs. It's usually um, uh, some impaired functions in terms of uh, um, speech, in terms of seizure, and some other nonspecific signs as well. So, initial presentations of the classic signs due to raised intracranial pressure. For example, if the patient has a, a blockade of the spinal fluid so, um, as a result of uh, pressure on the uh, either the third or the fourth ventricle, so they might have hydrocephalus. So what, what you can see is, uh, what you can expect is a lot of these patients are gonna have headache, which is usually worse in the morning. And a lot of times it would be associated with some degree of vomiting without nausea. And as the day goes by, the, the headache gets better and it's a same sort of pattern over and over again without any obvious cause. A lot of times, if you look at their eyes, they'll have tepaludema. They may or may not have some altered consciousness. And for smaller patients, and they, because of the uh, because of the uh, hydrocephalus, they also may have uh, increased head circumference with bulging fontanelles as well. Non-specific symptoms are loss of uh, developmental milestones. Quite often, depending upon the location itself, quite often they may have some gait or coordination problems, and they may also present with some cranial nerves deficits as well. Visual field defects at times is common, and they may or may not have seizures. And then, if somebody has metastatic disease, that obviously means that the there are drop metastases into the spinal cord, and as, as a result, depending on where the drop metastases are they may or may not be back pain with or without loss of uh, bladder function as well. So let's look at the medulloblastoma, which is one of the most common uh, brain tumors. Relatively uh, same associations that we just talked earlier. What's really important is uh, just to sort of highlight this, this patient. Uh, uh, this is one of my patients, um, about eight, nine year old, um, was very active in athletics and has had this uh, um, poor performance and some coordination issues for about, uh, about close to two months or so. And then also had um, uh, um, cranial nerve involvement. And then when the CT was done, on the right, what you can see is what the arrows actually highlighted. There's a very large uh, media, there's a very large uh, mass in the cerebellum. And it's also, I'm sure you can sort of appreciate it, it's also compressing the third ventricle. And as a result, uh, there's a hydrocephalus. So this patient has a headache because of the hydrocephalus. This patient has some coordination problems because of the, the primary tumor is in the cerebellum. And this patient has some uh, cranial nerves as well because of the location itself. So all those classic symptoms of infratentorial presentation for, uh, for, uh, uh, for this specific patient. And again, this is a very classic patient when it comes to cerebellar presentations. Let's look at the long term. The most important function, the most important um, aspect is whether the surgeons can resect it. If the surgeons can totally resect it with no residual disease, the outcome is excellent. A lot of times there may be some cognition uh, deficits that may require some extra um, interventions um, because of the radiation or some other um, uh, modalities. There may be some associated endocrine dysfunction. So growth and thyroid are usually uh, commonly affected. And then obviously if patient has gotten a radiation, then there's a risk for, uh, for second malignancy as well. So that was a nutshell in terms of um, you know, the leukemias, their presentation, lymphomas, um, how they present both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's, and then the brain tumors, um, and how they present in terms of adults and pediatrics, and the tentorium being the sort of uh, um, uh, the most important landmark in terms of presentation and location and their symptomatology as well. So the last maybe two slides. The you know when the patients get uh, a chemotherapy or, radi or radiation or any of the modalities, um, a lot of these patients will have some degree of bone marrow suppression. So fever neutropenia by definition is neutropenia by definition is if the absolute neutrophil count is uh, 
500 or less. And obviously, if the patient is running fever, uh, for us, fever is 101 degrees Fahrenheit or 38.3 degrees Celsius. So fever in the presence of neutropenia, by definition, is fever neutropenia. What's really critical is uh, when these patients are neutropenic and running fever, they need to be. Um, this needs to be treated as uh, as an emergency, and these patients need to be urgently seen in the emergency room and have a, a, have a very thorough evaluation, have labs done, electrolytes, and blood cultures from the uh, from the central line, and they should all be admitted with broad spectrum antibiotics. What's, uh, what's also important is uh, sepsis is relatively common in these patients. If the antibiotics are administered in a timely manner and all the, uh, and the antibiotic coverage is fairly adequate, then these patients really do well. However, if the patient comes in with bacteremia or with sepsis, then there's a very high uh, risk uh, for, uh, um, for, uh, for poor outcomes in terms of uh, a prolonged uh, hospital stay, um, bacteremia, um, ICU, and also some degree of mortality and morbidity as well. So initial um, management when they come in, um, a very quick physical. These are the patients who shouldn't be sitting around for too long. A very quick and detailed physical is, is, is mandatory. Um, uh, you know, uh, antibiotic coverage for, uh, um, um, for, uh, for, um, for broad spectrum coverage as well is, 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 uh, is, is mandatory as well. And all these patients, as I said earlier, have to be admitted criteria for discharge is uh, typically when the neutrophil count has recovered, meaning it's at least 500 or more and rising. A uh, patient is fever-free for at least 24 hours and looks clinically well. The cultures are all negative for at least 48 hours. And there's no site of infection. And once patient reaches these four sort of uh, um, uh, criteria, then the patient is ready to be sent home. Quite often when the patient is while the patient is still in the hospital, if, if the kid is still running fever, especially high fever, 38 or three or higher, then we do draw blood cultures and repeat it every 24 to 48 hours. At times we do uh, uh, send them for, for imaging studies, especially if the fever is prolonged. And for high risk patients, we do consider antifungal uh, treatment, uh, especially if the fever is persist persistent in the absence of a positive culture or a positive, um, 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 or, 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 uh, or an obvious site of infection. And there are also, for a small fraction of patients, we may consider uh, changing antibacterial coverage if um, after about for seven to 10 days of antibiotic coverage, the, um, you know, the fever is still an ongoing thing. So that's sort of in nutshell, you know, the, the management of fever neutropenia. I think in my mind, um, you know, fever neutropenia is something that we really have to uh, um, uh, be very well versed with, and we really need to be very sort of uh, um, um, thorough and very timely in bringing these patients up and doing those basic labs and starting antibiotics in a timely manner and admitting them and then keeping them in the hospital for um, for um, uh, for the duration of time until they meet all those three or four criteria. And once these patients have met those criteria, then obviously they could be a discharge home. So I think that's pretty much um, all that I um, have here. And um, I uh, will have some more talks on, for example, um, um, uh, pediatric heme onc emergencies. And there are a couple more uh, talks that we will hopefully record in the next uh, um, few weeks as well. So thank you.